Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today. Biden tells Netanyahu that he will not undermine him. So President Biden reassured Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he was not trying to undermine him politically by criticizing the Israeli government. And this was reported by Axios on Tuesday, and Biden gave Netanyahu this assurance during a phone call on Monday, which came after Chuck Schumer uh, gave his little speech about Israel and called Netanyahu an obstacle for peace and said that there should be elections in Israel. Biden was asked about what Schumer said, and he said that he thought he gave a good speech. So sources told Axios that Netanyahu complained about Schumer's speech and Biden's approval of it, prompting Biden to say that he was not looking to undermine the Israeli leader or intervene in Israel's domestic politics. Biden and other Democrats in the U.S. have tried to distance themselves from the Netanyahu government while also supporting Israel's mass slaughter of Palestinians and the starvation siege on Gaza. This criticism has not amounted to a policy change as the U.S. continues to provide Israel with unconditional military aid, as I as I am always pointing out. Um, so this was the same call where Biden and Netanyahu agreed that Israel will send a delegation to Washington to discuss Israel's plans to invade Rafah, the Gaza city on the Egyptian border, where there are 1.5 million Palestinians. Uh, U.S. officials have been cautioning against a full-scale invasion and are suggesting a more limited operation. According to the White House, Biden expressed to Netanyahu, quote, deep concerns about the prospect of Israel conducting a major ground operation in Rafah, where more than one million displaced civilians are currently seeking shelter after fleeing fighting in the north, end quote. But Netanyahu said on Tuesday, that he brushed aside Biden's concerns and reaffirmed that he's planning to attack the city. So this is the day after he spoke with Biden. He told members of the Knesset's Foreign Affairs Committee, quote, I made it as clear as possible to the president that we are determined to complete the elimination of these battalions in Rafa, and there is no way to do this without a ground incursion, end quote. Netanyahu said that Israel was under international pressure, but said that Israel was rejecting that pressure in order to achieve the goals that Netanyahu has set out. And we always have to keep in mind that the U.S. doesn't believe Israel can achieve those goals, namely eradicating Hamas. That's something Netanyahu always says he's going to do. U.S. intelligence doesn't think that they can do that. And Israeli intelligence, there's been signs that they don't think they could do it either. Um, they can't destroy all of the tunnels under Gaza and just, you know, the way that they're fighting the war, killing all these civilians is a total recruitment tool for Hamas. Um, so here we have, you know, Netanyahu and Biden, you know, trying to, you know, put put their issues aside and get along so they could continue committing these atrocities together in Gaza. All right, so the next one here, Blinken blames starvation of Palestinians in Gaza on Hamas. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that the entire population of Gaza was in a hunger crisis, but placed the blame on Hamas for the situation. So at a press conference in the Philippines on Tuesday, America's top diplomat was asked by a reporter about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, And Blinken said, quote, according to the most respected measure of these things, 100% of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of acute food insecurity. That's the first time an entire population has been so classified. 
The devastation brought about by the hostilities is indescribable. The escalation of hostilities has caused widespread damage to assets and infrastructure indispensable to survival. Extremely limited humanitarian access to and within the Gaza Strip continues to impede the safe and equitable delivery of life-saving multi-sector humanitarian assistance, end quote. So notice he says very vague things like hostilities have has caused this, not the Israeli siege and bombing campaign. Uh, and then Blinken went on to place the blame on, on Hamas for the uh, famine, uh, for the impending famine. He said, quote, we continue to face a horrific humanitarian situation for children, for women, for men in Gaza. In the first instance, of course, this is something brought about by Hamas, by its actions on October 7th, and by its actions ever since. This could have, as I've said repeatedly, been over many months ago if Hamas had put down its arms, stop hiding behind civilians, and release the hostages, end quote. Um, so he's also went on to say that it's incumbent on Israel to protect civilians and all, you know, he, he gave lip service to all of that, but it's just really something here. He's, he's acknowledging that a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the people in Gaza are facing a food crisis. And this is not some conflict where the U S where the government that he works for is some is, is passive in this. I mean, they're actively, actively supported, uh, the bombing by supplying the bombs, supplying intelligence and, and, propping up the the military that is blockading the Gaza Strip and and cutting off the food and impeding the aid deliveries. All right, so the next one here, civilians trapped as Israel continues to besiege Al-Shifa Hospital. So this article is from Middle East Eye, and it says civilians living in the vicinity of Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City say they have been besieged from every angle by Israeli forces over the past two days. On Monday, Israeli forces killed 50 Palestinians and detained 180 others during an overnight raid on the facility, uh, which is Gaza's largest medical complex. And this was the first hospital that Israel really laid siege to, you know, a few months back, claiming that there was some sort of Hamas command center underneath, and they they never provided any evidence for that claim. Um, So this raid continued on Tuesday, and civilians who spoke with Middle East Eye said that they were trapped. One person that they spoke with was a 29-year-old civilian, said that she was trapped with about 30 other people in a room in a nursery next to Al-Shifa Hospital, um, and that they don't uh, have anywhere to go, or and they don't know what to do. Um, so, of course, there's a lot of people sheltering in the hospital, on the hospital grounds. This is an area of Gaza where most of the, in Gaza City, most of the city's been destroyed, and it's one of the few places people can uh, take shelter. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. claims that it has not seen reports of Israel torturing UNRWA staff. So this article is from Brett Wilkins. A Biden administration spokesperson on Monday attempted to avoid addressing allegations by employees of the United Nations Agency for Palestinian refugees that they were tortured while in Israeli detention by claiming that the State Department has not seen any media reporting on the accusations. So Ryan Grimm, uh, who's a reporter for The Intercept, this was during one of the State Department press briefings, he asked Deputy State Department spokesman Vedant Patel if he believes the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA is the abbreviation for that, Uh, He asked if the U.S. believes UNRWA staff members who say they were tortured by Israeli interrogators into making false confessions about involvement with Hamas, uh, and he claimed ignorance. Um, So this is uh, basically after the question, Patel said that that he has not seen that reporting that the State Department is not doesn't doesn't know what he's talking about basically and this is something I think that was reported a week ago so it's been out there for quite some time and again this is uh, the agency that the U.S. cut funding for UNRWA um, which is which uh, they they of course are responsible for a lot of the aid in Gaza 
Um, and the U.S. cut funding for UNRWA immediately after Israel made these allegations, even though they offered no evidence. And the people that have seen what they tried to produce has, have, as evidence have said it, it's not evidence, that there's nothing there. Um, these allegations that UNRWA employees took part in the October 7th attack. Um, you know, you just compare it to what they know about Israel. They know Israel's killing civilians. Uh, it's very clear uh, what they're destroying in Gaza, uh, but they still continue to give them the bombs and the bullets to do it. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the aid organization. Any claims about them cut off immediately. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, Jared Kushner says that Gaza waterfront property could be very valuable. So this article is from The Guardian. And this is something here. So Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's uh, son-in-law, has praised the very valuable potential of Gaza's waterfront property and suggested that Israel should remove civilians while it cleans up the strip. The former property dealer married to Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka, made the comments in an interview at Harvard University on March 8th. Kushner was a senior foreign policy advisor under Trump's presidency and was tasked with preparing a peace plan for the Middle East. Critics of the plan, which involved Israel striking normalization deals with Gulf states, said that it bypassed questions about the future for Palestinians. And Kushner was actually in charge of this so-called peace deal that the Trump administration released, I think, in 2020, in January 2020. Trump called it the deal of the century, and it would have uh, essentially, the deal was that Israel would annex its all the settlements in the West Bank. They would annex the Jordan Valley in the West Bank, uh, a big chunk of territory, like right on the actual bank of the Jordan River. And they would create all these Israel-only access roads, which are already there. It would basically formalize the apartheid conditions for the Palestinians. They would have their little, you know, it looked like Swiss cheese, the map. Um, and there would be a tunnel going from the West Bank to Gaza. Of course, it was a not complete non-starter for the Palestinians, so it never went uh, anywhere. But that, so it's not a surprise that he says things like this. Um, so Kushner said in this interview, "quote Gaza's waterfront property could be very valuable if people would focus on building up livelihoods." End quote. Uh, he continued and said, quote, it's a little bit of an unfortunate situation there, but from Israel's perspective, I would do my best to move the people out and then clean it up. But I don't think that Israel has stated they don't want the people to move back there afterwards, end quote. And I saw in the video he was asked, because uh, he's talking about moving people out, moving the civilians out of Gaza and he was asked, well, you know, people are worried that Israel's not going to let them back in. And he's, so that's why he's saying, oh, I haven't seen them say that they don't want them back in. But Kushner also said he thinks Israel should move the Palestinians in Gaza to the Negev Desert in southern Israel. He said that if he were in charge of Israel, his number one priority would be getting civilians out of Rafah. And he said that with diplomacy, it could be possible to get them into Egypt. Uh, he said, quote, but in addition to that, I would just bulldoze something in the Negev. I would try to move people in there. I think that's a better option so you can go in and finish the job, end quote. Um, so this is uh, Kushner pontificating on what he would do. And his interviewer said, seemed pretty surprised by his response because what he's saying is, a, you know, talking about people moving moving the Palestinians to the desert, he was asked if that's something that they're talking about in Israel, and Kushner denied, you know, said, oh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm just talking about, I'm just looking at the situation and trying to figure it out. So he's not saying that, claiming any insider knowledge, but I am sure that he's talking to people in Israel about this. Um, and, you know, who knows what his position would be if, if Trump came back in? Would he be put right back in charge of this, uh, Israel, Palestine, you know, Middle East stuff. Um, so, you know, I mean, just to, to be talking about this stuff and say, hey, you know, that waterfront property in Gaza is going to be worth a lot someday, I bet. And I know that the Israeli settlers who want to reestablish Jewish settlements in the in Gaza, that's something that they've been talking about at these 
events and conferences that they have. They, 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 I've seen like models and, you know, drawings of what, uh, beachfront pro- property in Gaza could look like in the future. All right, so the next one here, U.S. strikes Yemen's Red Sea port of Hodeidah. So the U.S. continues to bomb Yemen. Uh, so the Houthis, Al Masira TV, reported that U.S. and British fighter jets launched 10 airstrikes against Yemen's Red Sea port of Hodeidah on Monday as the U.S. bombing campaign continues. So U.S. Central Command confirmed that it launched a series of strikes against Houthi-controlled Yemen on Monday, but did not say if the UK was involved. And then Yemenis, you know, the way that they've been reporting these strikes is they basically, it seems like they always say that it's U.S.-British airstrikes, or they call it U.S.-British aggression, because the UK joined the U.S. for the first round of airstrikes and several rounds since. But it does seem like it's mostly the U.S. uh, doing the actual bombing on its own. Um, and that's something, if you look at Houthi media throughout the, the Saudi war against them, they reported Saudi airstrikes as U.S.-Saudi aggression because they knew that the U.S. was supporting it. Um, so, you know, it goes to show for so many Americans who are probably unaware of the war in Yemen that was going on for the past uh, eight years or so, um, the people that are facing the the, the bombs, uh, you know, are aware that it is an American war. Um, so anyway, uh, CENTCOM claimed that between 1 p.m. and 7.40 p.m., again, this is on Monday, they said that they destroyed seven anti-ship missiles, three drones, and three weapons storage containers in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. N- no confirmation of the things that they destroyed from the Houthi side, from the Yemeni side. Um and there was no casualties reported as well. I know the Houthi leader, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, he said last week that 34 Yemeni fighters, 34 Houthis have been killed since this thing started. Um, and I know at least one civilian was killed, according to the Yemen Data Project, and that was also reported by Yemeni media. Um, so on Tuesday, uh, the Houthis, uh, officially known as Ansar Allah, announced that they targeted a ship named the Mado, which they described as an American oil tanker. I haven't seen any confirmation of that from the U.S. yet. Usually you see CENTCOM put out a press release about these attacks like the day after. Uh, And they also said that Yemeni forces fired missiles at southern Israel. And that was actually confirmed by Israel that a missile struck Israeli territory in in an open area near uh, Eilat uh, in southern Israel. And this is the first time, you know, no damage or anything reported or casualties, but this is the first time that Israel confirmed a Houthi missile actually hit their territory. Uh, So these things keep escalating. And I know I I, really beat this point into the ground, but it it just goes to show how this U.S. bombing campaign is, is just escalating the situation. And if anybody... If you knew anything about the Houthis, you knew that this is what would happen if the U.S. started bombing them. It wasn't going to stop it. It was just going to make things worse, and that's uh, what this is doing. And, you know, they've bombed Yemen. You know, they've launched hundreds of missile strikes, uh, whether they're from airstrikes or they're also firing, you know, from the, the Navy warships that are that are based in the Red Sea now. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, Hezbollah injures two Israeli soldiers in a rocket attack. So this article is from Jason Ditz. Two Israeli soldiers were injured on Tuesday near the kibbutz of Manara, near the northern Israeli border, when they were hit by Hezbollah rocket fire. The Israeli military said that they attacked the source of the rocket fire with artillery strikes. Uh, So the soldiers were moderately and lightly wounded, respectively. Again, it was two soldiers. Um, And Israel responded with attacks in several areas of southern Lebanon and they said that they the biggest attack was they said that they shelled a observation post that they claimed a Hezbollah member was entering I uh, haven't seen anything of, of casualties on the Lebanon side in these strikes but this has been I, every day now uh, this is happening is either Israel striking Lebanon Hezbollah striking northern israel or both we see the tit for tat strikes 
All right, so the next one here, Israeli airstrikes hit Syria for the second time this week. Um, so there was more Israeli airstrikes reported on the outskirts of Damascus. And this was early Tuesday morning. And uh, Syrian military sources told the Syria's news agency, Sana, uh, that there was just material damage and that some of the missiles were intercepted. And then Reuters, and there was other reports that said this, they cited Syrian sources who said one of the airstrikes hit a Hezbollah weapons depot inside Syria. So this is kind of could be related to what's happening in Lebanon. And we have seen frequent Israeli airstrikes in Syria. This is at least the second time this week that Israel bombed Syria. And they've been bombing Syria for years, but these things have really stepped up since October 7th. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in the UK, they're very anti-Assad, you know, pro-opposition. Uh, but according to their tracking, a total of 25 Israeli attacks have occurred in Syria this year, and that includes 17 airstrikes and eight rocket attacks by ground forces. All right, so the next one here, Russia to evacuate children from Belgorod. So the governor of Russia's Belgorod Oblast announced Tuesday that authorities will evacuate about 9,000 children from the area as Ukraine has been stepping up attacks on Russia's border regions. So this is the governor of Belgorod. He said, quote, a large number of villagers are being evacuated today. We are currently planning to evacuate about 9,000 children, end quote. And he said that over the past week, 16 people were killed and 98 were wounded by Ukrainian shelling in Belgorod. And I believe they're referring to artillery shelling as well as there's been a lot of drone attacks. And he said that over 130 residential houses and 60 passenger cars were damaged as a result of Ukrainian shelling just over the past day. And he said this on Tuesday. And there was a zoo in Belgrade that said it was hit by Ukrainian shelling and there was no people killed, but a, a kangaroo was killed in that attack. So Ukraine has increased its attacks on Russian territory as Russia has been gaining more ground on the battlefield. Russian forces have been making steady gains since taking the Donetsk city of Avdivka last month. And on Tuesday, Russia said that its forces took the village of Orlivka, which is about 2.5 miles west of Avdivka. And um, you could see on the map here, you know, that that's good when it comes to how much territory Russia has been gaining in this war. Uh, them taking a, a city that's 2.5 miles to the west or a village of Avdivka is... Uh, you know, that's pretty quick compared to what what it was like for the past uh, year, you know, before they took Avdivka. So, uh, but, you know, Ukraine, you know, this was a big deal when it first started, when Ukraine first started shelling these Russian border regions, because there's always that risk of escalation, especially if they're using U.S. or NATO weapons. It's always something to keep an eye on, and this has just been increasing and increasing, um, you know, with a decent amount of people being killed. All right, so the next one here, Austin doubles down on military aid for Israel and Ukraine. So this article is from Kyle at the Libertarian Institute. And Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin pledged that the U.S. would continue to ship weapons to Ukraine and Israel. So this, he made these comments at the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. And this is this gathering of military officials from NATO and, and a few other countries that Austin hosts once in a while, and and you know they all pledge to send more weapons. And his message at this one, of course, was, "We're not going to abandon Ukraine. Don't worry. Even though we didn't get this new aid package passed." And then he was talking about the the one that 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 money that they found last week to send Ukraine more weapons. Um, and that was basically his message. And he also reiterated that the U.S. will continue to arm Israel. Of course, he called it, said that Israel was defending itself, you know, repeated the usual, um, you know, propaganda line coming from the U.S. about that. But that was the message. We're going to keep funding both of these wars. 
And uh, don't worry, Ukraine, we're gonna get that. We're gonna get that money for you soon. That sixty-one billion dollars. All right. So the next one here: NATO chief praises Turkey's military support for Azerbaijan. So during a visit to Azerbaijan over the weekend, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg praised Baku's military relationship with Turkey, which helped Azerbaijan cleanse Nagorno-Karabakh of its ethnic Armenian population. So I saw this from, this is from, uh, I think it's Radio Free Europe or whatever, one of the U.S. state-funded media outlets. And it's their uh, Azeri uh, news outlet. Actually, sorry, it's their Armenian. It was their Armenian news outlet. And so Stoltenberg said this in a meeting with Azerbaijan's defense minister. He said, quote, the close cooperation between the Azerbaijani army and the Turkish armed forces will greatly contribute to the deepening of Azerbaijan's relations with NATO, end quote. The reason why I wanted to write this up is because you know, what Azerbaijan did to Nagorno-Karabakh, this ethnic cleansing campaign, uh, that's what that's what Turkey supported. That's what he's talking about here. That's the result of uh, Turkish military support for Azerbaijan. And you just see, you know, of course, Stoltenberg just spews so much BS rhetoric. I just thought it was worth highlighting him saying this. Um so Turkey strongly backed Azerbaijan's assault on Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020. That's when they launched the war, and Turkey supplied them with weapons. I mean, Erdogan was very, very publicly supportive of what they were doing. And there's also a lot of evidence that Ankara also sent mercenaries from Syria to help in the fight. Uh, the story I linked to, I was covering it at the time from October 2020, um, an account from a Syrian who said that he was hired by Turkey to go fight in Nagorno-Karabakh. And there was other evidence of it. Turkey has denied that, but again, there's a lot of evidence that, that they were actually doing that. Um, and Israel, Azerbaijan also got a lot of weapons from Israel as well. They were buying weapons from Israel, including cluster bombs that they were using. So the U.S. suspended military aid to Azerbaijan during the first Nagorno-Karabakh war in the 1990s or after it as a result of it um, but they resumed giving them military aid in 2002 under a waiver and president biden signed this waiver to continue providing aid to azerbaijan in 2022 uh, but he did not do so in 2023 really due to pressure from congress so just for those who don't know nagorno karabakh is a historically ethnic armenian area enclave that was within the borders of Azerbaijan you know what they call the internationally recognized borders of Azerbaijan and those borders actually around these areas were drawn by the Soviet Union when Armenia and Azerbaijan were uh, Soviet republics so that's the borders that they they st stuck with after the Soviet Union dissolved and of course there was a big Nagorno-Karabakh war as the Soviet Union was was collapsing um so and then in that that was frozen in I think 1994 and then Azerbaijan launched the assault in 2020 and that ended after about a little over two months with the Azerbaijan taking territory controlled by Armenia that was sort of around Nagorno-Karabakh and then in September 2023 they launched a final assault to take over completely take over Nagorno-Karabakh and because they had no help nobody was there to help them the government of Nagorno-Karabakh, known as the Republic of Artsakh, surrendered pretty quickly, agreed to dissolve the government, and all the Armenians living there, over 100,000, fled because they were afraid of what could happen to them. Uh, of course, there's a lot of history there. Um, so again, that's what Stoltenberg is, is talking about here. So when Stoltenberg was in Azerbaijan, he said that Armenia and Azerbaijan now have an opportunity to achieve peace, and he called for them to seize the opportunity. He was in Armenia on Tuesday, and he made the same comments there. And uh, the president of Armenia, uh, Pashinyan, who he is actually seeking closer ties with the West, he signaled on Monday that he might 
end up ceding more territory to Azerbaijan. There's these other disputed areas that Armenia still controls. And he, he was saying that the Azeris are going to start a war over it if he doesn't give it up. So it seems like he's kind of getting Armenia ready to accept that he's going to give that territory up as well because he, he's come under a lot of, you know, he's faced a lot of backlash for um, not defending the Artsakh and, and not intervening there. Um, so, and this is something, it's 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 still brewing. There, there's always a chance of this uh, turning into a war, but it seems like the current Armenian leader doesn't, doesn't want uh, a war, even if that means giving up this, this disputed territory. All right, so the last news story here, the U.S. is looking to stay in Niger despite an order to leave. So the Pentagon is looking to stay in Niger despite an order from the country's government for U.S. forces to leave. Pentagon spokeswoman Sabrina Singh told reporters on Monday that the U.S. was seeking clarification from Niger and is in talks with officials in the military-led government known as the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland. Um, so this isn't really a surprise that the U.S. is saying, hang on a minute, we're not, we're not pulling out right away. Let's, let's try to work something out here. Um, so we'll see if this gets to the point where Niger is saying, no, you have to go. And then, you know, if things might get a little hairy there. Uh, but it looks like, again, because they have that big drone base, that's what this is all about. Air Base 201, which cost over $100 million to build. They don't want to give them up. They don't want to give that up. Although they are in talks with other West African countries to base drones on their territory. But hopefully this ends with the U.S. Uh, packing up and leaving uh, peacefully. But we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, so that's it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Roger D. Harris. Biden's State of the Union address exposed by U.S. intelligence threat assessment. One from Pretty Julati Cox and Stan Cox. Gaza blocking the aid trucks, letting the tanks roll. One from Patrick McFarlane over at the Libertarian Institute. Culture warriors spread disinfo on Haitian cannibals. And definitely go read that. He gets into this narrative that Jimmy Cherizer, uh, also known as Barbecue, who's the main uh, you know leader in the Haitian uprising that's happening, uh, was falsely portrayed as a cannibal because of videos that people were spreading on X. There was one that was put up that was apparently from a few years ago of somebody biting into somebody's flesh, and they said, this is Jimmy Barbecue, and it spread. It was clearly not him. You could see the video. You see what it looks like. It's simply not him. But that spread like wildfire, and that's where all these the, the cannibal claims came from, which is just nonsense. Uh, one from Daniel McAdams called the TikTok Totalitarians. Definitely go check that out. One from Branko March Teach. Does Putin want to end the war? We should test him. Uh, so please go check all of that out. Uh, lots of good stuff in the blog as well, and some new stories that don't make the top section uh, at the bottom of the page all sorted out for you to check out. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, you can always support us by sharing this show. Follow us on Instagram. It's really looking great over there. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, and all that stuff. I'll be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.